This podcast is brought to you by CNN Plus. The world is evolving, and so is the way you explore its stories. Discover live news, original films, series, and access to a library of on demand favorites, all from CNN, the source you trust. Subscribe to CNN Plus today and get 50% off standard pricing for life. Stream all about it. Subscribe now at CNNPlus.com. Cancel any time, limited time offer ends April 26th. For the next two episodes of Boomtown, we're going to do things a little differently. My name is Susan Elizabeth Shepard. We are in a hotel in Midland, Texas. I am a journalist. I freelance mainly. Recently worked at a newspaper in Montana, Missoula. And I also have worked as a stripper for a considerable number of years. I'm actually going to step back and pass the mic to Susan. But first, here's a little more about our guest host. When did you first start stripping? I started in Austin, Texas in 1994 at the Yellow Rose. The Yellow Rose. It's kind of a famous club. It is. It's been around for many years in Austin. So how did you get into it? I walked into the club to apply for a waitressing job. I had been okay. working at a sushi restaurant in downtown Austin, and I heard that cocktail waitresses could make really good money at gentlemen's clubs. And I walked in and I thought, you know, that dancing thing looks like it's probably more fun than continuing to serve people drinks and asked Mm -hmm. the manager about it. And he said, come back at seven o'clock with your shortest dress and your highest heels. He gave me a legal thong and uh, that was that. What is a legal thong? A legal thong is, a, or was at the time, um, met the regulations under the TABC for a topless club. The TABC, by the way, is the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission. In Texas, it's the primary agency that regulates bars, including strip clubs. In Texas, uh, you can only have a liquor license if your dancers are still wearing bottoms, and the thong has to cover everything that the TABC says it does. So it has to be at least a, you know, a certain number of quarter inches wide at the narrowest point. At the time, Susan was a student at the University of Texas in Austin. While at UT, she interned at Texas Monthly for a semester. Eventually, she got married and moved to Portland. When I was working in Oregon, I made friends who traveled a lot. And one of those friends lived in Alaska. And we will be hearing from her later on, Tara. And she got me to come to Alaska for a visit. And it was there that I met some of the dancers that would kind of set me on a more broad traveling path. So I ended up going to Alaska and going out to North Dakota from Portland Went and worked in Atlanta, Philadelphia, worked in Indiana, Oklahoma, Montana, a few other places. In most of her travels, Susan's experience working the clubs was pretty much the same, regardless of the city or state she was in. When I would go travel to a place like Atlanta, or if I would go work in a town in Montana, the reason to go there would be some type of tourism, usually. Mm -hmm. People were going there for a sporting event, like going to the Final Four in Atlanta, or they were coming out to Montana or to Alaska to go fly fishing, salmon fishing. So these are people who are traveling to have fun. They're really happy to be out there. They're having a good time. They're partying. And that's why there's more, that's why there's more guys in the club. They're all out there to have fun. North Dakota, though, was an exception. When I went to Williston, North Dakota, the reason all the guys were out there was to make money, just like me. And they were out there to work. They didn't pick that place to go to because they always wanted to go to Williston, North Dakota. They were out there because they'd heard there was a job there where they could make better money than anything they were doing at home. This was 2007. The year before, that area of North Dakota had become the epicenter of an oil boom. Fracking had unleashed massive amounts of oil from the Bakken Shell Formation. I first went out to Williston in 2007, and I traveled out there until 2013. So I saw the buildup and Mm -hmm. kind of the peak there, yeah. It was very consistent there. You always knew that you were going to have a good week out there. There's all these guys that are out there. They're far away from home. They don't have much to do in the way of entertainment. They're kind of sick of just sitting around and staring at their coworkers all day, and they just want to blow off a little steam and do something, and that's one of their best options was to go to the strip club. Susan wrote about her experience in Williston 
in an essay for BuzzFeed called Wildcatting, A Stripper's Guide to the Modern American Boomtown. The women that I met who worked out there, like not a one of them was boring. They all had incredible stories and were just intrepid and willing to take an adventure and come out there. And I just thought there's something, you know, about an event that collects so many different kinds of characters in such a remote place. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing that really made me think it was interesting. You know, I heard some of the weirdest shit I ever heard in my life out there. (laughs) People really, you know, would just say anything. I'm Christian Wallace, and this is Boomtown, a podcast about the historic old boom playing out right now in West Texas. One thing that's been true for over a century, every time an oil and gas boom gets underway, it's followed by a boom in another industry, sex. It doesn't take an economist to figure out why, but even though this cycle is more than a century old, it still leads to conflict. To tell this story, we've enlisted the help of Susan Elizabeth Shepard, who you just met in the intro. Her insights and reporting are fascinating. She was joined in her travels around West Texas by one of our friends at Marfa Public Radio, reporter Sally Beauvais. You'll hear Sally's voice occasionally. This is episode five, and yes, this is the title, Boob Town. A few years ago, I was watching a documentary about gold prospecting in Oregon at the turn of the last century. A historian described how traveling dance hall girls worked a circuit through the gold fields to entertain lonely miners. He said that the dancers would complain of getting bruises on their ankles from gold nuggets hitting them. I was delighted to learn about this early instance of making it rain on dancing girls. It's a practice that's gone along with extraction booms for over a century. That tradition continues in the Permian Basin, For decades, women have traveled here to make money performing in strip clubs and selling sex. So we're standing outside of 1412 West Ohio in Midland, Texas, the George W. Bush Childhood Home Presidential Site and Museum. I came across a frequently repeated anecdote about their early days here. The one that I'm going to read from is from a Pamela Koloff story in Texas Monthly from 1999. The bushes started out simply enough in a shotgun house along an unpaved road where outhouses and mules stood side by side. It was plain living. Two prostitutes lived on the other side of the house, which was split into a duplex by a makeshift partition, and the male clientele kept the house's one bathroom busy from dusk through dawn. The term sex work was coined by activist Carol Lee nearly 40 years ago. The specifics of the definition are still debated today. But generally, it's understood to include everything from prostitution to adult modeling. When we talk about sex workers in this episode, we're talking about people who sell sex or perform in sexually oriented businesses, like strip clubs. Some of the other jobs we'll talk about are not sex work, but they're also lucrative gigs done primarily by scantily clad women for a male customer base. Like bartending, or waiting tables at a restaurant, such as Hooters, or making coffee in a bikini barista stand. Shortly after I stopped traveling to the Bakken, an entrepreneur named Nissa Gray opened the first Boomtown Babes coffee stand in North Dakota. The slogan was, The Bakken's Breast Coffee, and it got locally famous when the baristas helped bust a con man posing as an FBI agent after he got too pushy about trying to get free coffee from them. In 2018, Nissa expanded her Boomtown business to the Permian Basin, and now she's got two stands in Odessa. The Basin's Breast Coffee, right? That's what it says? Yeah, the Breast Coffee in town. The Breast Coffee in town. We're at the Boomtown Babes stand in a parking lot between an Albertsons grocery store and a big office building on a busy stretch of East 8th Street in Odessa. The stand is painted white with bright pink accents. The sign in front shows a busty blonde in a hot pink bodysuit climbing an oil derrick that's spouting coffee instead of oil into a cup in her hand. Okay, my name's Karina Ray. I'm the manager at Boomtown Babes. I make sure we have very pretty girls. I make sure they do their job. I make sure we're very, very nice and we always smile. We pretty much just wear lingerie. We're just a lingerie coffee shop. So, I mean, the guys come over here. They have to be at work early, so I guess we make their day. My name is Stephanie Maldonado and I work for Boomtown Babes in Odessa and I'm a bartista. All right. Um, can you tell us what you have on today? I have a Victoria's Secret lingerie bra and a Victoria's Secret lingerie underwear. 
you just and I have some Converse as well with it. I have a pink floral a bra on it, and then my underwears are purple because the bra has a little, like, little bit of purple in it. Stephanie has on beautiful fake lashes, and she also has super long brown hair down to her waist. What's your routine like in the morning? I wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, I get myself ready, and then I make sure my kids are, my kids' clothes is dressed before my husband wakes up so he can take my kids to school and then take the other one to his mom's house for daycare. What about getting ready for the shift? Getting ready for the shift, um, honestly, it's, sometimes it's kind of overwhelming because I'm like, I don't know what to wear. And I always tell my customers, like, I literally wear nothing, but I, I get so, it's like, overwhelmed, like, what do I wear today? What should I wear? Like, does this look cute? Does this not look cute? But, I mean, it always comes together. The drinks at Boomtown Babes are intense. Lots of sugar and lots of caffeine. You can get up to eight espresso shots in a drink. They have names like the Hot Shot, the Big Rig, and the Gold Digger. In addition to coffee, they also serve mixed energy drinks. So this is one of our favorites that a lot of people like to get. It would be Blue Raspberry with two Red Bulls and a 32 ounce um, and top it off with lemonade. That's Natalie Garza, another Boomtown Babes employee. She's making a drink called the Driller. Just want to shake it up and make sure everything gets mixed well. She passes the drink out the window to a young man waiting in a blue sports car. 20? His change is $11. He hands back the 10. Thank you. You have a nice day. Great investors don't follow the crowd. They do their own research and build their portfolio strategically and for the long term. M1 Finance gives you all the tools you need to grow your wealth without charging management fees so your money can work harder for you. Build a custom portfolio according to your goals or get started quickly with one of their pre-built expert pies that help you invest according to the investing style, strategy, and risk tolerance that works best for you. Then schedule your deposits, turn on auto-invest, and automate your every day money moves, freeing up time for the other things you want to do in life. It's all the simplicity of a modern app combined with the power of a traditional broker. Visit m1finance.com slash crime. That's M and the number one to see why money, Investopedia, and Yahoo Finance are raving about M1. Investing involves risk, including the risk of loss. M1 Finance LLC, member FINRA SIPC. Geico asks, How would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you can save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. Servers say working at Boomtown Babes nets them some pretty fat tips, ranging from $300 to $600 on busy nine-hour shifts. Karina, the manager, tells us that their customers skew blue collar. We get more oil full guys than white collar. People who are actually working out in the oil fields. Yeah, and those are the most generous ones. The guys that come in their white suits, like the people right here in the bank, they don't tip us. They just look at us. They do not tip us. They don't tip at all? At all. Never. Never. You have the prettiest girl here and they won't tip her either. What Karina is saying about her customers definitely resonates with me. It's not the oil company owners and executives that make a boom town worth working in. It's the guys making better money than they ever have before. I think they're better tippers, not just because they're feeling flush, but because they understand what it is to work for a dollar or 10. And they're loyal customers too. Stephanie says a lot of their business comes from regulars. Yeah, we have our regular customers that know what time we die down. And they'll come over here and man, we'll have a conversation forever for like 30 minutes and then a customer will come in and then one of our regulars will drive around just so they can be next to life so we can finish our conversations. Karina recruited Stephanie here from another job. She asked me if I wanted, like, if I wanted to be home more often, you know, and still have sufficient funds, of course, to pay my bills and get everything done and still be there for my kids. And I was like, well, for sure. And that's exactly what happened. Stephanie has more time to be with her kids. She says, all in all, it's a great job. But there is the occasional hassle. 
Every once in a while, someone tries to sneak a creep shot or take video of the employees. Karina says the occasional customer's girlfriend might look up the baristas on social media and harass them. And once, a woman called the cops, accusing them of prostitution. That kind of disapproval from strangers is one thing. But Karina's family also doesn't care for what she's doing. Oh yeah, of course, my parents. I don't talk to my parents because of it. My mom said that I was better than this, that she didn't raise me like this, uh, that I should have just kept going to school. She has no reason why I work here or get a normal job and work at the doctor's office since I'm licensed. How did that make you feel? At first, it made me feel bad, but at the end of the day, I focused on being a mom because this gives me more time to be with my kids and I make more money. So why am I going to be killing myself at a 40-hour job when I work half time and I make more money? Is it just your, your mom and dad? No, it's family we're... members too, but I, I like, they, my, like my brother told me something about it too, but I'm just like, dude, you go to Twin Peaks, you see girls on laundry all the time. So what's the difference? Do you, you know, what, what, do you, what do you think about that like kind of double standard for you know, the women who work and the guys who go? I mean, I don't think it's fair. I feel like as long as you're not doing anything bad, as long as you're not selling yourself or doing anything bad, I feel like it's a good job and everyone should do it. I mean, sex sells. The place Karina says her brother goes to, Twin Peaks, is part of a Dallas-based restaurant chain. Twin Peaks is maybe most notorious in Texas because its Waco location was the site of a massive shootout between police and multiple motorcycle clubs. Nine bikers died. But your typical restaurant is pretty sedate. There's a bunch of guys and some gals sitting around eating wings and drinking while they watch sports, and the waitresses serving up food in their sexy outfits. There's an independent restaurant in Odessa called Bottoms Up. I found out about it when I came across their popular Instagram. It features pictures of servers wearing as little as pasties under a fishnet top. The business was opened by investors from Dallas who saw opportunity in the Permian Basin. We stopped by there on a Saturday afternoon. College football games were playing on big screen TVs. They have 28 of them. It looked pretty busy to us, but Dee, the manager, told us it was actually a slow day. The bar is probably one of the largest, if not the largest, granite bar top in West Texas, which, you know, I don't know if that's like a thing, but it is kind of a thing, so. You're making it a thing. I'm making it a thing, it is a thing now. She brought us into the quieter back room, which functions like a club during private events at Bottoms Up. Uh, the club's called uh, Club Crude, uh, which is a play on, you know, the words, um, because we're in oil field country, so crude. Uh. There's a large lighted sign on the wall that says, Odessa, no dry holes. And any time um, anyone's here partying, they ch- always try to make sure that that gets on Snapchat some kind of way. <laughs> I asked Dee if the price of oil affects her business. It's more about the production. So if we're producing, if they're producing a lot, that means that all of my customers are out there working. Um, when they're not producing a lot, that means my customers are not out there working as much. So they have more time to spend in here. So regardless of price up or down, it's more about the production. In my opinion, I'm not an expert. <laughs> Dee maintains that their customer service, not their attire, is what sets them apart from other bars and restaurants. One of her bartenders, Sylvia Ramirez, agrees. We just go above and beyond for our customers as much as we can, like just remembering their names, remembering their drinks, how they like their spit cup set up and stuff like that. Yeah, it just, it always helps to like pay attention to those little details. Tonight's theme is fight night. So Sylvia's wearing Adidas running shoes, tall socks, athletic shorts, and a sports bra with skeleton hands on it. Yeah, um, I never wear sports bras ever. And then when I started working here, I was like, I finally have a reason for these. And today's also Dia de los Muertos. So I was like, I'll wear the one with skeleton hands. Perfect. (laughs) Just like Stephanie and Karina at Boomtown Babes, Sylvia is a mother who says that her job gives her more time with her child. Is anyone in your life sort of outside of this restaurant like judgmental of you for working here or anything like that? No, um, I, I, we grew up, so in Mexico, uh, like my aunts and everything, they were always like really like be yourself, do what you want, be yourself kind of people. And they themselves were like very out there and fun and whimsical and so was my mom. So they like understood like if you don't, do things the way you want to, you're going to find a way to do them anyways. 
So they were always really open about what I wore, how I dressed, like what I was into. So when I started working here, my family was just like, okay, like, are you happy? Are you, your bills are paid, your son's taken care of, you spend more time with him now. Like, everyone's pretty okay with it. Just about every employee we talked to at the coffee stands and the restaurant was a local. At the two strip clubs in the Permian Basin, which are both in the Odessa area, the opposite was true. That didn't surprise me. When I worked in North Dakota, nearly all of the dancers traveled there as part of a circuit. It was a small town, so there just wasn't a big pool of available workers to draw from. And anyone local would have to worry about running into someone they didn't want to. Plus, the clubs only let dancers work for a week or two at a time to keep the lineup fresh. That meant it wasn't a steady gig for locals. As I spent more time in the Permian, the thing that kept striking me is the region's sheer size in both area and population. It's 10 times bigger than any other boom area I've been around. Alaska, Wyoming, North Dakota, the Permian counties alone approach the entire population of any single one of those states. The strip clubs in Odessa are closer in size to the ones in Austin or Dallas. Upwards of 40 dancers work at each one every night and sometimes up to 80. Dancers can work whenever they want. It's also just a five hour drive from Dallas or San Antonio, making it an easy weekend trip by car. So as with everything else about this boom, the strip clubs and supply of traveling dancers is much bigger. Some of those traveling dancers started working at Rick's, the newer of the two clubs, when it opened in 2014. That's how Phoenix, who's now a waitress and who asked that we use her stage name, wound up here. We talked to her in a hotel room in Midland. Um, I'm originally from Dallas area. I've started coming out to Odessa in 2014, originally as an entertainer. And within the last two and a half years, I became a waitress. And now I reside here in Odessa. It's a pretty amazing job, um, pretty consistent, good people and uh, environment. I love my boss. One of Phoenix's managers at the club where she was dancing in the Dallas area took a job at the Odessa Ricks right when it opened. He told her she should come get a piece of all the money that was being spent in the Permian Basin. It was $100 a barrel back then, so girls were making anywhere from three to 10 grand a night. So that's when it was really, really booming. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. You would just, guys would just be throwing ones everywhere. Like you would make it rain on stage, make it rain in the cabanas. They were just, they were just coming in to blow their check, really. <laughs> I mean, like, you really didn't have to fight for money at all. Like, it was just there, like, being thrown at you. Part of being a traveling dancer is being prepared to deal with a different set of rules, laws, and requirements in every state, city, or county you dance in. Sometimes you have to get a license from the local authorities. Often, simply crossing a city or county line means the difference between a club where you have to wait to get approved before dancing and one where you can just go right to work. Since Ricks is just outside of Odessa city limits, Ector County officials determine the laws there. And everyone who works at Ricks, from the manager to the janitor, has to get a sexually oriented business, or SOB, license. Phoenix told us about what it's like when the sheriff comes out to make sure everyone is carrying their SOB card. Sometimes they bring like three, four people. Sometimes they roll in with like 12 to 18 people. It, it kind of hurts our club a little bit because like people are in there. I'm not saying that they're doing anything bad, but when you see that many cops in one place, it kind of does get a little intimidating. So we, we try to get them in and out as fast as we can. A couple of years after Rick's Open, the dancers had to cover up because of a dispute with the state controller's office over the Texas poll tax, as in stripper poll. It's a requirement that strip clubs pay the state $5 per customer. Texas was the first state to create a tax of this kind in 2007. And today, only a few other states have something similar. Both Odessa clubs are currently part of a lawsuit that argues that the state keeps moving the goalposts on the definition of nudity that determines which establishments have to pay up. The state says that Rick's owes back taxes for several years. Rick's lawyers claim that the way their dancers were dressed at the time in dispute meant that the club was only providing clothes entertainment and so was not subject to the tax. <laughs> we did lose some customers because we went from being able to see titties to having to, like, 
cover them up with paint. Like it was, it was t-shirt paint pretty much or, or pasties if you bought your own pasties. But I, I found out then that I was um, allergic to the latex of pasties because they would always leave a little, a little mark on me whenever I would take them off. So I just stuck with the little paint that they gave us. <laughs> Phoenix says that they couldn't wear thongs or even bikini bottoms. They had to be almost full coverage shorts which are referred to in the court filings as volleyball shorts. We kind of went through a hassle because some girls' butts are bigger than others. So, like, when you start dancing, they raise up. So it's, like, uncontrollable. But I'm glad that phase is over, though. Though the lawsuit is ongoing, state records show that Ricks paid the poll tax in 2018. Phoenix says by then, the dancers had already gone back to going topless and wearing thongs, which is still how they dress today. Dancers at Jaguars, the club right down the road, but just over the city line into Odessa, also work topless. Both clubs are owned by RCI Hospitality, a publicly traded company that started with the Ricks Cabaret chain in Houston. When RCI opened the Odessa Ricks, its CEO told shareholders he expected it to become one of their top earning clubs. And that's among properties in Manhattan, Miami, and Dallas. Branding counts just as much in the sex industry as in any other business, and RCI is savvy enough to know they need diversity in Odessa. Jaguars and Ricks have totally different vibes. Actually, a lot of people, like, not to make Jags sound like it's a bad place to be, but there, there are people who do like to go to Jags and people who think Ricks is a lot more classier. Um, we do sell, serve alcohol, whereas Jags is a BYOB club. There's a lot of class porousness at strip clubs. You'll see people from all kinds of backgrounds who'd never hang out together sharing shots at the bar. There's also a lot of lateral stigma within the business. The way Phoenix called herself an entertainer and not a stripper, that's the way that clubs that call themselves gentlemen's clubs refer to their dancers. Rick's definitely brands itself as an upscale gentlemen's club. There's bottle service and VIP booths available on the floor. It's got a more buttoned-up atmosphere than Jaguars. It's more blue-collar sister club, where the cans of White Claw hard seltzer we bought in were dumped into a hardware store bucket full of ice. We didn't record inside either of the clubs, but this booming bass that we taped from the Jaguars parking lot is characteristic of the party atmosphere inside. There were a lot more big groups of guys rather than solo visitors or pairs, and the club layout focused on the center stage, which had poles that had to be at least 15 feet high. The dancers we saw did some wild and impressive tricks, some of them swinging from the ceiling rafters. Because it's BYOB and you only have to be 18 to get in, Jaguars has a reputation as something of a rite of passage for the young people of the area. This podcast host, Christian Wallace, told me about how he and his friends drove to Odessa together to go to Jaguars for the first time the summer after they graduated high school. I used to work at XTC in Austin, which is another part of the RCI hospitality empire, and it had pretty much the same vibe as Jaguars. We'd get plenty of post-prom visitors, young soldiers from Fort Hood, and fraternity pledge parties. Jaguars has only been in the city limits since late 2018, when Odessa annexed the land it sits on and took over jurisdiction from the county. The city then decided it was time to update the old sexually oriented business ordinance, which was written in 1996. When Assistant City Attorney Dan Jones presented the new SOB ordinance to the city council in November, the first issue he brought up wasn't how much the dancers took off or alcohol policies. It was human trafficking. First and foremost, it makes human trafficking a priority because that is one of the most important things that we are experiencing as a nation in the past several years. Dan is referring to the increasingly common assumption that strip clubs and other sexually oriented businesses are rife with trafficking. The Odessa SOB ordinance aims to address trafficking by requiring clubs to post a sign with the human trafficking hotline number in each stall of the bathroom, in the dancers' dressing rooms, and at each entrance and exit, and also by adding trafficking convictions to the very specific list of offenses that can result in someone being denied an SOB license, which includes prostitution, sexual assault, and obscenity. we made it more stringent. we made it tougher to go in and get licenses, not just for entertainers, but for non-entertainers alike. Uh, let's take, for example, Let's say if you were a young lady and you were 
you have a, a prostitution conviction. Okay? You can't just go in there and dance. We just won't allow it. These suggestions didn't go completely unchallenged. A couple minutes after Dan spoke, City Councilman Malcolm Hamilton chimed in. Just to be devil's advocate here, don't you think that's a bit, I mean, I agree with you, but don't you think it's a bit discriminatory that because, let's say, I've been convicted of prostitution, who's to say I'm still prostituted? Maybe this is the only job that is available to me or I enjoy or... I understand. Uh, Council Member Hamilton, when I was a young kid in Mississippi, my daddy always told me, if you want to see what your future's going to be like, look at your past. Because your past habits will dictate what you do in the future. The exchange continued. Dan acknowledged that the policy is harsh, but he said it's necessary for the safety of the general public. And the list of disqualifying criminal charges aren't any different from the existing Ector County ordinance that governs RICs and up until the annexation had governed Jaguars. But this ordinance goes even further. At RICs, someone coming in from out of town can work while they wait to get their permanent license. At Jaguars, under the new rules, everyone who gets a job there has to wait until their license is approved. That can take up to 15 days. Once they get that license, they can't keep it in a purse or a locker. They have to wear it, display it on their person. What Jones didn't say is that no trafficking charges have come out of Ricks or Jaguars. In Odessa, two men were arrested last summer on charges of trafficking when two underage girls were found to be stripping at a private club. But the SOB ordinance doesn't apply to such clubs, only strip joints. But sex trafficking is how Dan justifies the stricter ordinance for Jaguars. So what's actually going on here? Next time on Boomtown, we continue our look at the sex industry in the Permian Basin. I was in a prostitution sting where I was actually in this guy's car um, in the middle of giving him oral sex. And he grabbed me by the hair and pulled me up and flipped me around and put me in handcuffs. Um, And honestly, I thought it was a serial killer. Boomtown is a co-production of Imperative Entertainment and Texas Monthly. Executive producer is Jason Hope. Produced and engineered by Brian Standifer, who also wrote the score. Boomtown is edited by J.K. Nickel and Megan Kreit and co-reported by Leif Riegstad. Our theme song is written and performed by Paik Rossi. I'm your host and writer, Christian Wallace. This episode was produced in collaboration with the award-winning crew at Marfa Public Radio. Thanks again to Sally Beauvais for her work reporting and editing this episode. If you're outside of West Texas, you can follow them at marfapublicradio.org. Texas Monthly's parent company also owns interest in the midstream oil and gas industry, among other diversified investments. Our editorial judgments are made independently of any such investments. Don't forget to tell your friends about Boomtown and leave a review on Apple Podcasts if you like the show. Boomtown is a 10-episode series with new episodes available every Tuesday. Follow us on social media and visit texasmonthly.com boomtown for more on this story.